evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He sprang out of where? Judah. Out of Judah. He came out of the tribe of Judah that is black unto the ground. Keep going. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. He spoke nothing concerning that priesthood. So we see right here that Jesus himself sprang out of the tribe of Judah. And we know right now that when God formed man of the dust of the ground, that the man he took from the dust of the ground had to be the original man because we call ourselves aboriginal. The Caucasian don't call himself aboriginal. We call ourselves Aboriginal. Ab means we are abstracted from God and original means we are the original people come from God. Sure. So this is all just plain. It's like Brother Daniel say, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It just take you reading the scripture sure. line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little. And so we look at the Egyptians now. The Egyptians now we know is no big secret that the Egyptians are dark people. Black people. I remember some years ago, I was reading Sun Times paper, and on the front cover, they had a great discovery. We've discovered that the original Egyptians are dark people. I said, well, we knew that. All you do is read the Bible. That's right, bro. But they thought it was some kind of big deal because they found out that the Egyptians are dark people. But when they said that, had they known or put the scriptures together, who lined up? would almost looking like Egyptian. I don't think they would have printed that because we know that Moses was what? He was raised around Egyptian. They thought he was an Egyptian. Yes, sir. And when Jesus, when Herod was out to try to kill Jesus, when he was a little baby, he told Joseph to what? Take Mo Jesus and go hide amongst the Egyptians, yes, sir. black people. And we know that Paul, when he was on trial, when he wanted to speak to the Greeks, they asked him, I thought, can I speak Greek without being an Egyptian? Paul was mis mistaken as an Egyptian. Dark people. Mm -hmm. Even Joseph, when he went down in captivity, when Pharaoh made him second in command, you know, and when his brothers came down there because of the famine in the land, his brother thought he was an Egyptian. Sure. Even Moses was mistaken as Egyptian. And we see that Moses himself, being a dark man, married who? He married an Ethiopian. Yep. And they headed out that, well, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron got mad at Moses because they say he married a black woman. It wasn't because he married a black woman. Mm -hmm. He was mad. They was mad at him because he married a woman of another nation. She was a Hamite. And he was from Levi. He was a Semite. Mm -hmm. So it's not that he was, they was mad because he married a, a dark woman. She married a woman of another nation. And Solomon married an uh, Ethiopian. So these people gathered together and they married people that looked like them. So we see right here that the Egyptians are dark people. Now let's look at this. Let's look at another group of people that was mistaken as the Egyptian. Not just Joseph, but also somebody else. Let's go to Genesis, the 50th chapter. Hello, guys. Hello, guys. Welcome back again to our channel. And of course, if you're here for the first time, subscribe. Now, I always tell people that uh, it's good to learn your history because uh, if you are well equipped with your history, uh, it's very much difficult uh, for someone to lie to you or tell you something that uh, does not console with uh, your personality. Now, it's always good to learn history and uh, whoever is ignorant of his history or his story or his background, I can say that uh, he's a fool. He's a fool and he's a slave. So do not accept to be a slave. Please know much about who you are and uh, where you came from. And it's good to be equipped with the history knowledge. Now, I came across a video here of this black professor. He is a black, um, he is an African American uh, professor, and he's going to take us through the history of uh, the Bible. You know, it's always say, it's said that uh, the Bible is a black book. It it has a black history. It came from uh, black people from Africa. There are collection of books which were taken from Africa and uh, compiled together to form a Bible. So it sounds like it's a, it's a white book, but if you read it deeply and analyze and uh, uh, dig much information about the Bible, you'll, you'll get to understand that the Bible is a black book. The history of Bible is, um, is surrounded by the black uh, stories, uh, black people, black stories, black history, black, yeah, it's all about black. So I want us to watch this professor as he take us through the history of the Bible. Then we continue with our analysis. Let's dive in and watch. 
here at the house of Jacob, where we do everything by the scriptures, by the word of God. And uh, today's lesson is, is the Bible, our black history book. My name is Brother Elbert, and the reader for today is my brother, Brother Frank. And today we're going to deal with black history according to the Bible. Because a lot of times we read about the black history or we have black history in our schools. And only for us, as far as they go back is when they came over on ships during the African transatlantic slave trade. And that's as far as they go because our people really don't know their history. And any time you, like last month or this month of February, is Black History Month. But I want you to know that any time you pick up this Bible, whether you're here on the Sabbath day reading it or whether you read it at home or whether you are uh, here on Question and Answers Night on Wednesday night, you are reading about our black history because this is what this book is all about. That's why God gave his word to Israel, because this book is about Israel and about us. And he gave it to us, for first of all, because we were his chosen people. And who could tell our own history better than us? If he was a German and he wrote a book about German history, who could tell the history about Germany better than them? They lived it because the book is about them. And so we're going to look at today is all the Bible, our black history book, because this book starts back way back dealing with the dark people way back before Israel. When we call it black history, we're going to cover this all the way back. And then we're going to come up to the time that Israel started, because if you look at it, our nation, Israel was 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 formed, was 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 birthed. On the continent of Africa doesn't mean that we are African, but that's where it started on the continent of Africa. There are many different nations on the continent of Africa. And when we look at this, we look at the, the commandments. The commandments of God was given to Mount in Mount Sinai to Moses on the peninsula, which is east of Africa, east of Egypt, which is on the continent of Africa. The first Passover and everybody does Passover, including the Catholics and everybody. They call it communion. But even though it was first instituted by Israel on the continent of Africa by dark people. And so God gave his word, his instructions, his laws, everything to Israel. But he gave it to Israel to minister this word to everybody else and to share this word with everybody else. And we look at the Bible. The Bible talks about Israel. and It's mentioned Israel 2,575 times. That means that this book is talking about Israel. So if you're part of a church and they don't ever talk about Israel and salvation, then what are they teaching? Because it's all about Israel, about Israel, why are we in the condition that we're in? It talks about Israel going back to the land, but it talks about Israel also ministering this word to other nations. And we're going to start off this and we're going to start off this in Genesis, the second chapter. Because when we talk about black or we talk about so-called black or we talk about the, uh, if you want to call it the Negroes or you want to talk about people of color. Let's look at this. Where did we originate from? Where did we start? Let's look at this. Let's look at when was the first the first nation ever mentioned in the Bible, the entire Bible. Let's see what was the first nation ever mentioned in the Bible. Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter. And we're going to look at this. We're going to go to Genesis second chapter. We're going to start reading at verse 10. And when you get it, brother, read. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Mm -hmm. The name of the first is Pison. That is, that is it which compassed the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. Now, Havila, who was Havila? <laughs> Havila was the grandson of Ham. He was the son of Cush that we know today as who? The Ethiopians. But we're going to read on further because a lot of people want to see the exact name of the first nation mentioned in the entire Bible. And we read this and we read it for years, but never really thought, never really thought to put a picture or a race to the people that we read about in the Bible. We just read it and read it. And we probably read this a hundred times, but never really thought who was the first nation ever mentioned in the entire Bible. Let's keep reading, brother. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedelium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compassed the whole land of Ethiopia. Of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the first nation mentioned in the entire Bible. And we know that Ethiopian are what? A nation of who? Dark, Dark people. 
And I stand strong on this because a lot of people, if there was any other color, we would be saying that they was that color. But because the Bible has been distorted so by people who have read the scriptures, but never really put an identity to the people that we're reading about. Mm -hmm. They never put an identity to Moses, to Joseph, to Jesus and uh, Solomon and all these people, even Job. They never put an identity to it, but they read it. And here we see in the last day, God said in the last day, knowledge will be increased Same. and knowledge is being increased. Now, let's go on over here to Genesis, the second chapter, and we're going to start reading uh, back up here. We're going to start reading at verse seven, Genesis, the second chapter, and we're going to back up and read verse seven. And when you get it, brother, read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. It said God formed man of what? <laughs> The, the dust, dust of, the, of ground. the ground, and he did what? Breathed into his nostril the, the breath, breath of, of life, life, and man became a living soul. So if you ever watched on TV where they talked about the creation of man, what man, what color was this man? He was a Gentile. Let's just call it like it was. He was a Gentile. And if you ask the anthropologist, the geneticist, the biologist, the historian, they will all agree the same thing when they will tell you that if the dust of the ground is brown to black, then it is impossible for you to create a man and take him from that dust and that man come out to be pale. Now, I don't mean to sound radical or militant or anything like that. That's just common sense. Things that need to be brought out today because people are so afraid of offending people by talking and saying what the color of people, the first man was a dark man. Well, they have offended us all our lives by telling us lies, saying that the first man was a Caucasian. So it's impossible for you to take the dust off the ground and make a man out of that. And all of a sudden, this man is pale because when God said that he on the sixth day, he looked at all he created and said it was not only good, but it was what? Very good. Yes, that means the man lacked nothing. That means that when the first man was created, had to have enough melanin in his skin to survive the UV sun rays of the sun to live on Earth. So what does that mean? What is melanin? Melanin is the substance that creates a, to determine how dark the hair gets, how dark the eyes are, or how dark the skin is. So if you came out and, and created man and he was pale, then that man, that means that the man lacks something. Mm -hmm. But when God created man, he said everything he created was very good. Yes, sir. Now let's look at this. Let's go to Jeremiah, the 14th chapter. And let's look and see what color was this dust of the ground. Let's go to Jeremiah 14 chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. Jeremiah 14 and verse 1. And when you get it, brother, read. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dirt. Dirt means not <laughs> having enough. Keep going. Judah mourned. Judah mourned. And the gates thereof language. Now, when it said Judah mourned, they talk about who? The Jews. Yes, now, we know that the people that call themselves Jews now aren't mourning. As a matter of fact, they're doing pretty good. Yes, sir. So if they were mourning, they're mourning because they haven't made uh, quite the amount of millions they want to make in this lifetime yet. But the real Jews, who are the tribes of Judah, we're the real Jews because who? We're mourning all the time. Yes, sir. For one thing or another, what? We're mourning. mourning. That's so right. that lets you know right there who are they talking about here. They talking about the real Jews in this country right now who are mourning. It said Judah mourning and the gates thereof language. What does that mean? The gates, when you put a gate around a house, that gate is around the house to what? To protect it. Right. To secure it. But we know that the real Jews, now us, we have nothing around us to protect us or to keep us. Not even the laws of the land protect us and keep us. So it said right here, Judah mourner and the gates thereof language and what else? They are black unto the ground. They are black unto the ground. The real Jews are what? Black unto the ground. So when people look at that, they'll say condition. Well, they still talking about the color of the ground, the dust. It said Judah mourner, the gates thereof language, and they are what? They are black, black unto, the, unto ground. the ground. And you look at the dust. And you can say, well, the dust is brown. Well, let me tell you something. When my little brother and I used to go fishing, we used to have to dig up worms. And the worms, they lived in the cool of the dirt, which is deep into the ground because the darker the dirt, the cooler the dirt was so much until it's almost black. Mm -hmm. So when it talks about they're black unto the ground, the deeper you go, the dust is 
black. So we say Judah. Let's look at two things right here. Let's look and see who came out of Judah. What man we know came out of the tribe of Judah that is black unto the ground. Let's go to Hebrews, the second seventh chapter. Hebrews, the seventh chapter. We're going to read one verse. And this is when Moses was given the qualification of the priest, because normally the priest would come out of Levi. But he's speaking right here about Jesus having been becoming a priest, but he didn't come out of the tribe of Levi. Let's go here to Hebrews seventh chapter. And we're going to read one verse in verse 14. And when you get it, brother, read. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He's praying out of where? Judah. Out of Judah. He came out of the tribe of Judah that is black unto the ground. Keep going. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. He spoke nothing concerning that priesthood. So we see right here that Jesus himself sprang out of the tribe of Judah. And we know right now that when God formed man of the dust of the ground, that the man he took from the dust of the ground had to be the original man because we call ourselves aboriginal. The Caucasian don't call himself aboriginal. We call ourselves Aboriginal. Ab means we are abstracted from God, and original means we are the original people. Come from God. So this is all just plain. It's like Brother Daniel say, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It just takes you reading the scripture. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little. And so we look at the Egyptians now. The Egyptians now we know is no big secret that the Egyptians are dark people. Black people. I remember some years ago, I was reading Sun Times paper, and in the front cover, they had the great discovery. We've discovered that the original Egyptians are dark people. I said, well, we knew that. All you're doing is read the Bible. That's right, bro. But they thought it was some kind of big deal because they found out that the Egyptians are dark people. But when they said that, had they known or put the scriptures together, who lined up? with almost looking like Egyptian, I don't think they would have printed that because we know that Moses was what? He was raised around Egyptian. They thought he was an Egyptian. Yes, sir. And when Jesus, when Herod was out to try to kill Jesus when he was a little baby, he told Joseph to what? Take Mo Jesus and go hide amongst the Egyptians. Yes, sir. Black people. And we know that Paul, when he was on trial, when he wanted to speak to the Greeks, they asked him, I thought, can I speak Greek without being an Egyptian? Paul was mis mistaken as an Egyptian. Dark people. Mm -hmm. Even Joseph, when he went down in captivity, when Pharaoh made him second in command, you know, and when his brothers came down there because of the famine in the land, his brother thought he was an Egyptian. Sure. Even Moses was mistaken as Egyptian. And we see that Moses himself, being a dark man, married who? He married an Ethiopian. Yep. And they headed out that, well, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron got mad at Moses because they say he married a black woman. It wasn't because he married a black woman. Mm -hmm. He was mad. They was mad at him because he married a woman of another nation. She was a Hamite. And he was from Levi. He was a Semite. So mm -hmm. it's not that he was, they was mad because he married a, a dark woman. She married a woman of another nation. And Solomon married an uh, Ethiopian. So these people gathered together and they married people that looked like them. So we see right here that the Egyptians are dark people. And now let's look at this. Let's look at another group of people that was mistaken as the Egyptian. Not just Joseph, but also somebody else. Let's go to Genesis, the 50th chapter. Genesis, Genesis 50th chapter. And this is after Jacob had died. And Pharaoh had given Joseph permission to go bury his father. We know that this Pharaoh right here he was a Pharaoh that really liked J uh, Joseph because mm -hmm. the other Pharaoh wouldn't have given him this opportunity. So he told Joseph, take some time off and go bury your dad. And let's start right here. Let's start reading at verse six. <clears throat> Genesis 50 and verse six. And when you get it, brother, read. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. Mm -hmm. And Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Now he had him go up, he had uh, the <clears throat> people of his house, and he had people from, the, from Egypt. There was a mix of them, just went up to bury his father. So he had Israelites, 
and Egyptian. Keep going. In all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. Mm -hmm. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. Mm -hmm. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. Mm -hmm. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And they mourned for seven whole days. At that time, that's what they did. They mourned for seven whole days. Keep going. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. He said, this is a grievous mourning to who? The to the Egyptians. They didn't know that these were Israelites mixed with Egyptians, or else they would say this is a grievous mourning of the Egyptians and the Israelites. But they just said this is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians because all they saw was Black people. Keep going. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. Now, what this means right here, it says, call that place Abel Mizraim. Mizraim is another name for Egyptian. Now, what this Abel Mizraim means, mourning of Egyptians. So that's what they were saying right there. But they didn't know that these were guys were Israelites, but because they all looked alike. So what does that tell you? The lineages of, of, of Jacob, all 12 tribes, and Egyptian were dark people. Sir. It were dark people. Let's go over here to Job 3. You all know who Job was. We're going to go over here to Job 30. And Job at this point was explaining his sickness. We're going to go here and read one verse. That's Job 30 and verse 30. And when you get it, brother, read. My skin is black upon me. And my bones are burned with heat. He said, my skin mm -hmm. is black upon me. And what? And my bones are burned with heat. Now, I got to tell you something right there. There is no person, unless you're already dark, mm -hmm. can get so sick that your skin turns black. Mm -hmm. You have to already be dark. Even a dark person, a, 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 people, a person of color, a dark person can get so so full of famine that your skin turned dark. You can get so sick, your skin turned dark. No one else get that. So that what that tell you right there, that Job was so sick until his skin just turned not just dark, but black. Mm -hmm. But black. And people read the story about Job so many times. Job was sick so long to his flesh fell from his bone, but they never had a chance to really go any further here and look and read that what color was Joseph. And so we're not just dealing with a race thing right here to just try to give you some kind of, 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 of racial pride or anything like that. But because we have been lied to for so long about who we are and where we came from, because once a people find out the great people that they came from, they would no longer at any time disrespect themselves or anybody else anymore. When you realize the greatness of people that you came from. That's when you begin to realize, and once you know who you are and where you came from, then you can start realizing what it is that God expects of you. Because you don't know your identity, then you don't know what it is he expects of you. Once you realize, I am an Israelite, a true Israelite, and as a true Israelite, I just can't be just a physical Israelite. I got to become a spiritual Israelite. Then that means I have to start keeping these laws and these commandments. And what happened with most people today, they don't want to keep any laws and any commandments. They don't want any restriction. But it doesn't matter whether you're in a motorcycle group, a gang bang, or a sorority or fraternity. They have written guidelines that you have to follow. You're not just going to join a group or a club and not have guidelines to follow you. But now when it comes to serving God, people just think that I don't need laws. Mm -hmm. Just do what you want to do. As long as I come to church every Sunday and pay my tithes, all that, that matters. But you got to have guidelines to follow. And then you get the preacher get up on Sunday and say, we're no longer under that law. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You're not no longer under that law. That's why you're not keeping them. And that's why you're in the condition that you're in. But if you want to get into the kingdom of God, guess what? You got to get under that law and you got to start keeping it. That's it. So when it come down to serving God, they don't think we should have guidelines. Just do what you, what's what separates you from a sinner. Mm hmm. When the Lord judge you, what's going to be the difference there? The difference is the sinner don't keep the law and serving God does. That's it. Sure. That's the bottom line right there. 
That will determine you in the judgment when you stand before the Lord and be judged. Let's go over here to Jeremiah 11 chapter. And we see these things that happen to us and we know what we're going through and why we're going through. Well, most of us, some of us do. But let's look and see whose fault is it that we're going through what we're going through. Let's go to Jeremiah 11 chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse nine. Jeremiah 11 chapter and verse nine. And when you get it, brother, read. And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and mm -hmm. among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. In other words, the same sins that got us kicked out the lands, the same ones we're doing right now. And even though we got finally kicked out of Jerusalem back in 70 AD, guess what? We still not keeping the laws and the commandments. I mean, we as a people still aren't keeping those laws and those commandments. So you can't say, well, we got kicked out of land because they messed up. Well, guess what? You still not keeping the laws and the commandments because you still going to church on Sunday. You still keeping those pagan holidays. You still doing the same thing. You want to be different from your forefather. Then you start doing keeping those laws and these commandments. That's the first thing that we have to start doing. When we turn back to God, that's the first thing we have to do. Repent and turn back to God by keeping his laws and his commandments. Keep going. They refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their father. Who did? The house of Israel and the house of Judah broke the covenant. God didn't break the covenant. They broke the covenant. That he made with their forefathers. Keep going. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them. He said, I will bring evil upon them. And let me tell you something. You see a person, a Sunday go worshiper and tell them God can God brought evil upon us. I guarantee you they will almost literally almost fight you. Fist fight you. When you say something like that, God won't do that. God won't bring no evil. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He said, I will bring evil upon them. Keep going. Which they shall not be able to escape. Mm -hmm. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. And when this he brings evil upon you, it don't matter what you do. It don't matter what you say, how much you cry. You just got to take it. And he's going to bring it on to you. And ain't no way you can escape it. And we're in this land right now. The only way we can find some kind of mercy is we turn back to him. As he said, if you bethink them. When they sin to turn back to this place or facing Jerusalem and pray and repent, then he said, then I will have compassion on you and I will cause your enemies to have compassion on you. But if you out there right now winging it, guess what? That's why so many of us getting shot down in the street. That's why so many of them now, you're lucky if when the police pull you over, all you get is a ticket. That's right, bro. They're not throwing handcuffs on you and throwing you back of a car. And when he walk away after he's giving you a ticket, what's going to happen? Whew, man, I get to go home. That's sad, but that's just the way it is. But when you come under the umbrella and you repent of your sins and turn back to God, the scripture said, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And if you want to abide under that shadow of the almighty, then just get under those laws and start keeping those commandments. Keep going, brother. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. Now, when they're in trouble now, it don't matter how much you pray and cry when you're in church on Sunday. What did you say a while ago, brother? He said he that turned away his ears from the, the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Sir. When you don't keep these laws and these commandments, what's an abomination? That's something that's filthy and disgusting. That's right. And brother. when you don't keep these laws and these commandments and you pray to God, it's filth. And it's disgusting to him because you don't do what he say. What makes you think he going to hear you? He don't hear you. Mm -hmm. That's just facts. Now, let's look and see what happened to us. That was foretold by Obadiah when we didn't keep those laws and those commandments. Let's go to Obadiah. The tenth, well, it's, it's Obadiah. Start reading at verse 10. Obadiah, verse 10. And when you get it, brother, read. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. And thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, mm -hmm. and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. He said, when they came in, 
when Titus, emperor of Rome, came in, Vespasian came in in 70 AD, as was foretold by Jesus, and destroyed Jerusalem, guess what? Edom, our brothers, was as though he was one of them. Mm -hmm. He had no mercy on, them, on us whatsoever. And for some reason, Edom has always been like this with Israel. That's why God said, Jacob, I love, but he saw I hate it. Because of violence against his brother, even when they was in the mother's womb of Rebekah, they fought. They fought. They, they just didn't get along. Even when Moses had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and they want to pass by the land of Kadesh, and they asked my brother, can we pass by? We're not going to mess with none of your food. We're not going to mess with none of the water. And if we do, we'll pay you. He said, no. That's what's Edom. And to this very day, to this very hour, Edom, whether you know it or not, feels the same way about us today. For some reason, that's just, you know, that's why I know this, the word of God right here, because only a God could put a curse on us that could be so perfect. Yes, sir. And this curse that he put on us, like you mentioned a while ago, brother, we are by word in the proverb. No matter where we go as a black man, say so-called black person on the face of this earth, no matter where you go, somebody get mad at you, what they going to call you? That one word. They can't speak English, but they know that one word. Yes, sir. They'll call you. And it could say it so perfectly, yes, so sir. good. Mm. That has to be the perfect curse, man. Yes, Can't sir. nobody else do that. It's like they went to curse 101, mm -hmm. you know, to know how to speak that word. And they speak it against us. And so he said right here, you call on the God that you serve when you get in trouble. And this is what happened right here because we became strangers in when they came in and destroyed that and destroyed Jerusalem. Keep going, brother. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. They spoke proudly against us. Sir. They was glad what happened to us. Yes. Because what happened is that when we got kicked out of Jerusalem, out of the land, guess what? They moved in. Yes, sir. And they took on everything that we had, our identity, our land, our faith, everything. They took it on. So when somebody began to call himself uh a uh, 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 nationality so much over the years, they began to believe it. Mm -hmm. And they began to believe it as we began to forget. And they took on our identity and they, they called themselves us. Now let's see what happened to that city of Jerusalem that day. Let's go to Daniel 9. And we're going to start reading at verse 9. And we're just talking about our history here. That's all. It's just a history of us that's even recorded in the history books. It happened to us. And we're going to start reading at verse 9. And when you get it, brother, read. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. He said, to him belong mercy and forgiveness, even though we rebelled against him. He still got compassion and mercy on us if we ask for it. Keep going. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God mm -hmm. to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. Yea. All Israel have transgressed thy law, mm -hmm. even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. He's right here. Because we transgressed the law, guess what? The curse is poured on us. And brother, it's on us. Sir. And guess what? It ain't nothing we can do about it right now until when the Lord returns. So we was talking earlier. How do you get free then? You get free in your mind. Because like, like John said, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And what? And the truth shall set you free. It sets you free in your mind. Then all we have to do now is just wait for that other freedom when the Lord returns and take us back to the land. But we have to be freed here. And unless you freed here first, when he returns, guess what? You stuck here. You stuck here. He said right here, because this curse was poured upon us. Keep going. And he had confirmed his words, which he spake against us mm -hmm. and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven had not been done as had been done upon Jerusalem. He said under the whole heaven. It said right here at the beginning that and he had confirmed his word. He confirmed it, meaning that what he said he was going to do to us. He did it. He confirmed it. He said, you won't see if I'm going to do it. Guess what? I'm going to do it. You want to mess up? 
my word is going to go forth. For my word shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please. So when we mess up, he confirmed his word because the Lord sees everything we do. So what happened when we fell from that law and we just start keeping the laws and commandments of God? God's word had to go forward. He already spoke it. Now all it did was just spoke what he set out to, for it to do. Then it said under the whole heaven, no city had been destroyed like Jerusalem had been destroyed. Because when they went in, Titus, they destroyed everything. They killed everything in sight. Sure. Women, children, priests. They even threw the priests out in the, in the middle of the street. That's how much respect they had for them. And when they killed, it was a slaughter. And those that did escape, did escape. But those who didn't, they t killed them or either they took them into captivity. And we're going to read this in the last two million years to show you that this actually took place. So when we read from books, we don't use the book to confirm the Bible or to validate the Bible. We use the Bible to validate books because this is the word of God right here. Well, they never said anywhere else in history books anywhere. We use the Bible to validate other books to see if those books have recorded the truth. So we're going to go to the last two million years, page 89, to see this first dispersion. When you get it, brother, read. Faith survives the dispersion. Mm -hmm. The crucifixion of Jesus about A.D. 30 did not end Jewish resistance mm -hmm. to the Roman occupation. Mm -hmm. In 70, when the country was again in a state of result, revolt, Jerusalem, <clears throat> the holy city, became the core of the resistance to the Romans. Mm -hmm. Titus, the son of Emperor Vespasian, proceeded to lay siege to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. The city fell. And the inhabitants were enslaved in their thousands and dispersed throughout the Mediterranean world. This was the first dispersion and worse was to follow. He said, this, this is the first dispersion and the worst was yet to follow. That's, that's good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. And yes, so sir. we see right here that like Obadiah called it and like God had already said from the very beginning, it happened. Because what's in that book right there, this book isn't prophecy, not right here. It recorded history. This Bible right here prophesied what was going to happen, and it happened, and our books recorded in history exactly what happened. And let's go over here to, to page 279. We're still in the last two million years. We're on page 279. And this is when the African transatlantic slave trade first started. But see, understand something. This wasn't the first time that Africans were sold, or not African, but uh, we were sold into slavery. You got to understand, we had what was called the Arab slave trade, which was 800 years before that. Then we had the Indian Ocean slave trade. So right here, we're just reading about the transatlantic African slave trade. After we had escaped from Jerusalem, we migrated down in West Africa. Okay, and let's go ahead and read that, brother. Africa. The Portuguese set up trading posts in Arab East Africa, mm -hmm. early Zimbabwe, capital of the Bantu Manomotapa Empire, mm -hmm. is completed with walls, temple, and fortress of stone. Mm -hmm. it, trades, it trades via Kilwa, the Portuguese, English, and Dutch ship 900,000 Negro slaves from West Africa to the America. mm -hmm. Americas. The French... English and Dutch found colonies in North America. The Pilgrim Fathers reached New, reached New England in 1620. The New World imports nearly 3 million Negro slaves. So in that first voyage, 900,000 were shipped, okay? And they packed them in, like Brother Dana explained it yesterday, in a loose pack or a tight fit. So, but what happened was is that they packed them in. And they want to call us and they brought them to to this Western Hemisphere in North America. And they brought them here and they call this the New World. And every time some the, the uh, or I would say the Gentiles or the Caucasian discover something for the first time, they call it new. Like it never existed. They call it the New World, 1492. And then they call it New England. They call it New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. New Orleans, New Mexico. Paul Newman, everything is new to yes, them, sir. Yes, as sir. though it never existed before until they see it. But there are already people here when they got here. That's right. So we see right here that they brought us over on what? On slave ships. Yes, now, this is what recorded in a history book. But now we're going to use the Bible to validate if this true 
in the history book. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and we're going to read one verse, verse 68. Deuteronomy 28, and we're going to read one verse, verse 68. And when you get it, brother, read. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. He said, bring you again into where? Into to Egypt. Egypt. We talking about Egypt right here represents bondage. So he's going to bring us in by how? Ships. How do we get here by? Ships. ships. We are the only group of people that came here to this country against our will and get treated worse than anybody. Mm -hmm. And we were bought here by ships. Not a luxury liner, not a cruise ship. But ships, everybody else migrated here. Sir. They traveled here. They snuck here. We're the only group that bought here against our will and get treated worse than anybody. We're the only group of people that came here and worked as slaves for over 400 years. And then finally, in 1965, they passed a civil rights bill that gave us civil rights and a right to vote. And every 25 years, they have to take that bill before Congress and vote on it. Now, what other group you know that that happened to? Sure. Nobody else. You can come to this country, be illegal, and still have more rights than we do. And what if Congress woke up one day when it's the 25th anniversary to vote on this bill, and they woke up in a bad mood? And said, I'm not going to vote on that bill. I'm not going to vote. Guess what? If they shoot that bill down, we don't even have a right to vote no more. Now, who is that? That's only happened to one person. Us. Us. And then they said in that bill, you got to treat them right. You got to do this. You know, you can't legislate morality. That's right. You bro. can make somebody hire me, but you can't make nobody love me. So what is that? That means that this curse is on us, man, and it's on us. And there ain't nothing we can do about it but except turn to God and beg him for mercy and start keeping them laws and those commandments. Now, let's back up here. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28 and verse 28. And we're going to look at something. What happened on that voyage of ships that were coming over here that were bringing slaves? Let's see what happened here. I want you to read that one verse, verse 28. And when you get it, brother, read. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. It said the Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Now, what did that happen there? We wonder, why is this happening to us? Yes, sir. And you have people saying, well, I'm so glad I'm not y'all. Mm -hmm. Astonishment. They're astonished by what's happening. And then madness. We look at the madness on those ships as history recorded, as they was bringing those slaves over, some of the young slaves, as they realized what was about to happen to them. Some of them, when they had an opportunity, because madness had set in, they jumped over the side. That's right. They would rather face the death of the shark or the persecution of coming over here being slaves. So they jumped over the side. They didn't want to face it. Some, when they had to, when they could, they wheeled themselves to death because they would rather face sudden death by jumping over the side, being eaten up by sharks, than come over here facing the persecution of being a slave. And then you look at that and people say, well, that's madness. I would have done that. That's crazy. Well, then look at 9-11, mm -hmm. World Trade Center. That day when those buildings was on fire and those people that were there, when that hot fire and the smoke and the flames started, was in that building, these people that jumped out the window, they were just regular people. Sure. They weren't militant or some militia group or some uh, uh, radical group. They were just normal people, just like the people on those ships. They had probably left home, you know, kissed their kids by because they were sitting there. And you had someone just probably in that building with just office workers, pencil pushers, computer workers. But all of a sudden, at that moment, when those flames started burning, they was faced with a decision right at that moment. They probably looked out that window many, many times, never thought that they would have to make a decision to jump out that window. Madness. So when those flames started heating up, they would rather face sudden, sure death than the persecution of those flames. So what did they do? They jumped out the window. That's right, brother. So when you look at what these slaves or these slaves, when they came to this country, they faced madness. When given the opportunity, they jump. So that's what we are faced with in this curse. That's one of the curses. There are many curses that, 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 that we face until this very day that we have faced. And let's go let's go on down to verse 45. And when you get it, brother, read. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee 
and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed. They're going to pursue you like the brother said earlier. It's nowhere you can go. They're going to run you down. They're going to find you and they're going to pursue you and keep going. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes mm -hmm. which he commanded thee. Mm -hmm. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Now, you want to know who the real Israelites are? Look and see who these curses fit. Because now we have a lot of people call themselves Israelites, want to be Israelite because they love the idea of being God's chosen people. Yes, sir. So they'll say that, oh, we're, we're God's chosen people. We're God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. we, we, we believe we're Israelites. Yeah, you want to be an Israelite. But let me ask you this. Do you fit it? Do any of these curses fit you? Sir. Do you have you been sold into slavery? Because like I was talking to brother early, unless you've been sold into slavery and have an astonishment of heart and sometimes face madness and been persecuted like we've been. Guess what? I don't care what color. You're not a true Israelite. You're not a true Israelite. Even the people who come from the motherland that they call Africa. Unless you're an Israelite, they didn't suffer slavery. Right. Not like the Israelites were because God gave his laws and his commandments to Israel. And like he said in Amos, you Israel have I known of all families of the earth. Therefore, I'm going to punish you for your iniquities. So you want to see who the real Israelites are? Just see who these do these curses fit. Then you got the real Israelites. Because like I said, everybody wants to be an Israelite, but they don't want to face what the Israel have to go to. Let's go to Zephaniah 2. And we're going to read one verse. Zephaniah 2. And we're going to read one verse. Zephaniah 2 and 1. And when you get it, brother, read. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. He said, gather yourself together. What do we do? We gather ourselves together. O nation, what? Not, not desired. desired. And why do we gather ourselves together? Because who's responsible for teaching us this word? Nobody else can. So what do we have to do? We have to gather ourselves together because what? Nobody desires us. That's right. Nobody wants to be around us. They don't have nothing to do with us. So why do you think we have to integrate or they march so against, you know, to, to have integration that we integrate it into a society of people that don't even like us? We are a nation not desired. They don't want us to move into the neighborhoods. They don't want us in their schools. Why? Because we are a nation not desired. They don't want to have anything to do with us. And what happened? Because first of all, we don't know who we are. Yes, sir. And when you don't know who you are, then they could treat you any way they want to treat you. And let's see how exactly how did this happen. Let's go to Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Isaiah 5, and we're going to read one verse, and that's verse 13. And when you get it, brother, read. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. He said, therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they what? Have, have no, no knowledge. knowledge. Remember this, it said they are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. It didn't say they went into captivity, then they lost their knowledge. We are going into captivity because we, what, have no knowledge and keep going. And their honorable men are famished. Do the honorable man, the ministers, the so-called preachers are famished, meaning they have no knowledge. They don't know nothing. They're not teaching them the word. The honorable men are famished. Keep going. And their multitude dried up with thirst. And the multitude is a congregation of dried up with thirst. In other words, they have no knowledge. But it says right here, therefore, my people are going into captivity because they what have no knowledge. When do we lose this knowledge? Let's go to Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. Deuteronomy, eighth chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse 19. Because when your pastor have no knowledge, guess what? The whole congregation is thirsty. Yes, sir. They are thirsty for the word. We're going to start reading at verse 19. And when you get it, brother, read. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. He said, if ye shall do what? Forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, 
and serve them and worship them. He said, I testify, then you shall, you shall surely perish. So what happened first? When you forgot God, then how do you think you're going to stay in the land? When you forget the one that gave you the land or took you there, the promised land, and then you forget him, what makes you think you're going to stay there? It's just like when I was a boy at home and my dad told me to do something and I didn't do it. And he didn't get mad. He just walked in there and said, boy, as long as you live under this roof, when you get to the point you can't do what I tell you to do, it's time for you to go. And I know he meant that. And I knew he would do that. He would kick you out. If you can't do what he said under his roof, then you got to go. So when you're in the land that God gave you that you didn't have to fight for, work for to get, and then all he said, all you have to do is just keep my laws and my commandments, my people, you can stay here. And you decide you're not going to do it, guess what? Just like the people who were in that land before them got kicked out, guess what? Israel got kicked out too. That's right, brother. Because we forgot God. And when we got kicked out, that brought us right here. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32 and 26. And he said it in Psalms 83. He said, he said, uh, uh, there was conspiracy. And he said, come, let us cut Israel off from being a nation that the name may not may, may no longer be in remembrance. Yes, sir. And that's exactly what happened because people don't know who Israel is today. Israel don't know who Israel is today. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a funny thing because I've been going on YouTube and all of a sudden you got all these Edomites, Gentiles. Even guys over there in, in Israel now have, on YouTube saying, hey, you African-American people, you all are the real Israelites. Sir. You all are the real Jews. And they're coming out saying this. And it's look like everybody now is seeing this, but Israel. So he said that he said, if I had told you to go to a strange language and give this word, they would they would listen to you. But he said, because my people right here. We'll, we'll, what? we'll stiff neck people. Let's go right here to uh, Deuteronomy 20, 32. We're going to read verse 26. And when you get it, brother, read. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. He said I would make the remembrance of them to do what? Cease. To cease from among men. So when, they, when we came over here as slaves, one of the things that they did during this part right here was they took the old slaves and they separated them from the young slaves. And they even took the babies that was in the mother's hand and snatched them out of their arms because what they wanted to do. They didn't want the old slaves to remind the young slaves where they came from. That's why they was able to change their names and bring them up and have them serve other gods because they separated them. They put the old slaves over here. He put all the young slaves over here. It was a process, but it's all in God's plan. It was all his plan. Now, let's go over here to Ezekiel 36, because once we got kicked out of that land, there was another person, another person that moved into that land. No land was left desolate. Somebody had to move in that land when we got kicked out of the land. Let's go to Ezekiel 36 and we're going to read one verse. That's verse five. And when you get it, brother, read. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all I do may. I do may. I do may is just the same as Esau or Edom or what you see in Mount Seir or Otemon. It's all talking about descendants from Esau. So we see right here, I do may. Keep going. Which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. They have taken the land. The land that was our inheritance. And when did they take it? When we got borrowed out. Because the scripture says, it's as though you were one of them. So what did they want? They want us out of land anyway, so they could take over it. Sure. So what we have over there now, we have the Ashkenazi Jews. We have the Sephardic Jews. We have the Edomites. And they all calling themselves Jews. But guess what? They don't affiliate themselves with none of the tribes of Israel. Hmm. And most of them don't even believe in Jesus. So how did they become Jews? The Ashkenazi Jews became Jews in 740 A.D. when they went from paganism worship to Judaism worship. That's it. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't even affiliate themselves with Israel. Then you have the Edomites that moved into the land, took on our identity. So everybody else is calling themselves Jews by their conversion, by because they worship Judaism or they 
practice Judaism, they call himself a Jew. That's just like if I become a Catholic, all of a sudden I'm a Caucasian. Mm. Well, let's just say you can't change nationality because you change religion. But that's what they did. And so we see that when Israel became a state in 1948, you had in 1952, you had president of Egypt, Abdel Nasser, came on TV and told those who had they passed a law called a law of return. Mm -hmm. He told them those who were calling themselves Jews. He said, you would never be welcome here or you would never live in peace here. He said, because you left here black. And you came back white. Yes, sir. So this guy was already president. He had nothing to accomplish there. Right. But he won't let them know. I know who you are. Mm -hmm. You're not the real Jews. And we see that we have those who have moved into that land and took over that identity. But guess what? Someone moved into the land where the ten tribes were and took on their identity. And let's go to Second Kings. 17. And we want to read. Let's read one verse. Actually, let's start reading at verse 23. I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, start reading at verse 20. Okay. Okay. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. Mm -hmm. Verse 23. 23. Mm -hmm. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants to prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And their own land that they were in at that time, they had migrated into the northern part of the country because the two tribes, uh, uh, Benjamin and Judah, stayed down in Jerusalem. And the ten tribes, they migrated up north into Samaria, to Shechem. And what happened there? Keep going. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cuthat and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Now, when they were took the children of Israel, 10 tribes out of Samaria, he brought in his own people and replaced them there. So the 10 tribes are gone and they was replaced by other people, just like when they, we got taken out of Jerusalem. They was replaced by people and they were now the people of Samaria. That's why when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples, his 12 disciples, he told them, don't go by the Gentiles or don't go into the city of Samaria because those weren't our people there. Because if there was what an Israelite still in the, in the city of Samaria, he would have told him to go there because he was sending his disciples to the lost sheep of Israel. Mm -hmm. So the people who were in Samaria were not the original children of Israel. They were replaced. So that's why when he was, met the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, mm -hmm. and she said, when he asked her for something to drink, she said, why are you being a Jew talking to me, a woman of Samaritan? Because they had this thing back there. They would not talk to anybody else. But the people in Samaritan weren't the original Israelites. Mm -hmm. Let's go on over here to Revelation 2 and see what God has to say about those who are calling themselves Jews. Because they're not going to get off scot-free by, by putting up this lie all their lives. We're going to go to Revelation 2 and read one verse. And that's verse 9. Revelation 2 and verse 9. And when you get it, brother, read. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Now we read this and he says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. How could you be in poverty and still be rich? How is that? Okay, we in, he know our works. He know that we're in tribulation right now because Jews are in tribulation right now. Yes, sir. He said we're in poverty because we are in poverty. Some of us got some people got a few dollars, but we're still in poverty. He said, but thou art rich. How are we rich? Because God gave us his word. Yes, sir. He gave us his word when he blessed Jacob with the dew of heaven. And he blessed Esau with the dew of the land. The dew of heaven was his word. Mm -hmm. And Esau, we know as Edom, was blessed with the riches of the land. So that's why you have the Edomites today. Boy, they, they own everything. Yes, sir. Everything. Edom could come over here and set up a uh, by that land cross the street. Before you know, they got a big bank setting up over there. That's just the way God blessed them. But he blessed us with his word. That's why he chose us, his people. And that's why he made his covenant with Abraham, because he blessed us with his word. 
Because this word is gold tried in the fire. That's right, brother. And it's been here. And people can say they believe this word or not. Let me tell you what. This word has been here. It has been put through the test. It has withstood the test. Mm -hmm. So he said right here, I know thy works. And tribulation and poverty, he said, but thou art rich. Keep going. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. He said, I know the blasphemy of them that say that they are Jews, but they're not. Isn't that what President Nasir said? Y'all ain't the Jews. Yep. I know who you are. Keep going. But are the synagogue of Satan. He said, but thou art the synagogue of Satan. Now, when we worship or we come to church, we don't call this a synagogue. When Edomites or the so-called Jews go to worship, what do they call them? Synagogues. Synagogues. They are the synagogues of what? Of Satan. Let's tell you right there who the real Jews are. Now, this last right here, we're going to go to 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. And there is hope. Let's go to 1 Kings, 8th chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse 46. And when you get it, brother, read. If they sin against thee. For there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives in, unto the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whether they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies. Now, we right here, we're in this land. When we have sinned and we messed up, he said, if we just turn from our sinful ways and turn back to God and repent, what did he say? Which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee. And give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. Now what he said right there, if we turn from our sins and ask God to forgive us, guess what? Not only will he have compassion on us, but our enemies will have compassion on us also. And we know that when the Lord returns, he's going to have even more compassion on us by taking us back to our land. So I thank you. May God bless you and keep you from the word of truth. After watching this video, guys, I really want to know your thoughts. Please talk to us in the comment section and tell us what you think. Tell us your mind. What do you think about this? Do you think that the professor is well equipped with the information about uh, the history of the Bible and the history of the black people uh, as as related with the Bible. I want to read you something that I came across via the Wikipedia as I was doing my research about the Bible. The Bible. The Bible, in bracket from Koin Greek, is a collection of religious texts or scriptures, some all or a variant of uh, which are held to be sacred in Christianity, Judaism, Samaritanism, Islam, and uh, Baha'i faith and other Abrahamic religions. The Bible is an ontology, in bracket, a compilation of texts of a variety of forms, originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek. The text includes instructions, stories, poetry, prophecies, and other genius. The collection of materials are accepted as part of the Bible by particular religion, traditions, or community is called the biblical canon believers in the bible generally consider it to be product of divine inspirations but the way they understand what that means and interpret the text varies the religious texts were compiled by different religious communities into various official collections the earliest contained the first five books of the bible called the torah in hebrew and the, the pentateuch meaning five books in the greek the second oldest part was a collection of narrative histories and uh, prophecies, in bracket, the Nevim. The third collection, in bracket, the Kotuvim, contains Psalms, Proverbs, and uh, narrative histories. Tonaki is an alternate term for the Hebrew Bible, composed of the first letters 
of those three parts of the Hebrew scriptures. The Torah, meaning teaching, the Navi, meaning prophets, and the Katuvim, meaning writings. The Mosaic text is the medieval version of the Tanakh in Hebrew and Aramaic. That is considered the alternative text of the Hebrew Bible by modern Rabbinic Judaism. The Septuagint is a Koin Greek translation of the Tanaki from the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. It largely overlaps with the Hebrew Bible. Then Christianity began as an overgrowth of uh, Second Temple Judaism using the Septuagint as the basis of the Old Testament. The early church continued the Jewish tradition of writing and uh, incorporating what it saw as inspired authoritative religious books and so on and so forth. With estimated total sales of over 5 million copies, the Bible is the best-selling publication of all time. It has had a profound influence both of Western culture and history and on the culture around the globe. The study of it, though biblical criticisms, has indirectly impacted culture and history as well. The Bible is currently translated or being translated into about half of the world languages. Like all languages have the Bible version because the people found it to be a good book with educative stories and teachings. So people translate the book into their languages so that they can spread the good stories or the good news of the Bible. The term Bible can refer to the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible, which contains both the Old and the New Testaments. The English word Bible is derived from Koine Greek, Romanized, the Biblia meaning the books, singular, Babio, Babylon. The word Babio itself has the literal meaning of scroll and came to be used as the ordinary word for book. The Bible is not a single book. It's a collection of books whose complex development is not completely understood. The oldest books began as a song and stories transmitted from uh, generations to generations. Scholars of the 21st centuries are only in the beginning stages of exploring the interface between writing, performance, memorizations, and the oral dimension of the text. Current indications are that writings and orality were not separate so much as ancient writing was learned in a context of communal oral performance. The Bible was written and compiled by many people who many scholars say are mostly unknown from variety of disparate cultures and backgrounds. Now, this is a bit uh, contrary to what we learned in schools, you know. <clears throat> what we learned in schools is totally different stories as per what we learn here. Uh, when you are studying the Bible in your high school levels or in your primary levels, you get to be told that the Bible is a collection of books, yes, the way they say it here. But uh, this, they also add that uh, it's a book written by people who are inspired by God. Okay, this is a concept that just meant to make you accept the Bible as one of the holiest book that ever existed, which is not true. The Bible is a collection of books which were brought together, written by many people in just one language, the Greek, the Greek language. Then later, people decided to translate this book into languages that they can understand because the stories that are found in the collection of books, the Bible, is uh, somehow authoritative and uh, helpful to the current life because, you know, human being must be controlled by a set of rules and regulations. So because because the Bible was written as an, an authoritative book uh, to help relay some command and some information to the people. So people found it to be a good book. That's why they uh, decided to translate this book into various languages to enable them spread the good vibes into their communities, the good information, the good deeds, uh, the good behaviors into the society. So it was translated into many languages. In fact, it's also in, in Swahili language. It's also in a Luo language, Luo language. People took the Bible as a holy book not knowing that the Bible is just a collection of books of many people's writings 
many people's stories. So it was meant to also control human because human being must have a set of rules to to direct them and help them correct their behaviors. You know, a black person knows that the Bible is the work of God. You know, is the work of God. God inspired many people to come up with the with this uh, Bible, which I can say that uh, it might be true or might not be true because Bible is not just a book. It is a collection of books put together. Make a Bible a complete book. Uh, with complete rules and directions of how man has to live, how man has to interact with the people around them. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and uh, correcting many misinformation. Okay? We learned uh, a lot of false information about uh, Christianity, about, about the Bible itself, about religion, and so on and so forth. Many Africans got this information wrong. People tend to value Bible as a very holy book that has to be taken good care of, should be well preserved, should, should be respected because it's it's a walking word of God, which is not true. I don't know what to think about that, guys. Please talk to us in the comment section. And of course, if you're here for the first time, please subscribe, like our videos, and uh, tell us more about what you think. If you agree with the professor, that's good. And tell us your thoughts. What do you think? Your mind. Please talk to us until we meet again our next video show. Thank you.